Good morning and welcome to the 43rd anniversary celebration of the life of Martin Luther King Jr. The old ways of separation cannot stand. We must find new patterns for uniting people across all boundaries. Dr. King said, we're already geographically one. We must now become spiritually one. Hence our guest speaker's topic this morning, the Interfaith King. Ibu Patel will be introduced to you by our president, Dr. Franklin, later. Won't you now stand for our opening prayer? Let us pray. Dear God, we are grateful for this moment grateful for the opportunity to commemorate greatness, both the greatness that has gone before us and the greatness that is within each of us. Teach us now how to go about our work with the understanding that we are not alone, but rather belong to a greater work that encompasses all of humanity. Teach us to live lives full of unbridled love, compassion, and courage so that we may transform this world into a place of harmony and consciousness. We pray this prayer with the utmost faith that everything is always conspiring for our good. In your name we pray, amen. We are gathered this morning to reflect, to remember, and to celebrate the life and legacy of one who has shaped the DNA of our institution forever, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., class of 1948. 1948. There is so much that could be said about Dr. King and, and has been said, yet each year his life takes on new meaning for us. We pause to remember him, the life he lived, and the dream he left for us to fulfill. Dr. King was more than a speech. He was more than a preacher. He was more than a leader. He is more than a holiday. And he is certainly more than a monument. He was and is and will always be one of America's greatest prophets. And when we limit his legacy to quotes and community service, we do ourselves a dishonor. King calls us time and time again to reconsider our young unfolding lives, to reassess how we order our days and the directions we ultimately decide to take. Dr. King was a man, a human being, flesh, and sometimes we have the tendency to turn our celebration into a beatification of a man who only wanted to do God's will. And when we remember this simple truth that he, like us, walked this, this very campus, we realize that he is our example and not our exception. Dr. King was a man of faith, a Baptist preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, who understood that his call as a follower of Christ was not simply a song of praise on Sunday morning. His Christian conviction propelled him to bear his own cross, and without the shedding of blood, there is never salvation. As he stood in pulpits around this country as a moral guardian, a conscience, and a voice, so can we. Always remember, brothers, that you don't have to be a big name to change the world, and you don't have to be a preacher to be a prophet. All you really need is a heart for the people and a courage that cannot be bought, no matter the price. King was a singer and a mighty chorus of freedom fighters. Freedom fighters who understood that liberation was not a destination, but a journey. However, death has called many of them, and we all know their names. But the chorus, the chorus is always looking for young, emerging, vibrant voices to carry on its song. All you need is a heart that is willing to sing amidst the overbearing loudness of oppression. 
All you need is a faith that sees the sunshine when life seems to be at its darkest hour. All you need is the courage to sing out even when your oppressor tells you to shut up. Our time, brothers, the time that we live in this society is in need of voices, not echoes, but voices to sing redemption song. And while we look around searching for the next voice, we ought to look no further for we are the voices that we have been listening for. It only takes a voice, a voice that will speak up and speak out for the brothers who look just like us, who may be younger and older than us, who are sitting behind prison walls this morning for trumped up drug charges. The world needs voices, a voice that will sing out of hope to hearts sinking in despair from life's raging storms. The world needs our voices, a voice that will raise awareness for the reality of poverty in this country, in spite of a particular political party that seems to continually disregard and disrespect those living in the basement of our great society. And you ask, when shall we sing this song? The time is now and always right now. The world needs our voices. And regardless of what God has called you to be, there is always room for more in Freedom's Chorus. This is our legacy. Good morning. We celebrate the Morehouse College Glee Club under the direction of Dr. David Morrow and each and every one of its talented members. Tonight they will be featured with cellist Yo-Yo Ma at the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. The tickets are sold out, but I urge you to tune in this weekend as that concert will be replayed on radio and television. It'll be an extraordinary occasion, and we celebrate the Morehouse College and Spelman College Glee Clubs for their performances. Let's honor them again, please.
we welcome you to the spring semester 2012. One of the ways in which this community that nurtured and produced Martin Luther King can honor his message and his life would be for Morehouse College to practice nonviolence each and every day on campus and around us. And so, gentlemen, let us be a community that observes zero tolerance for violence, zero tolerance for mean-spirited speech or behavior. Let us demonstrate good character. It's my pleasure today to welcome to the Martin Luther King Chapel a very special guest and one of the nation's leading thought leaders, Dr. Ebo Patel. He's the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps, an international Chicago-based nonprofit agency whose mission is built on three important principles, appreciation and knowledge of diverse religious religions and philosophies, meaningful encounters between people of different beliefs, and shared service projects between people of different backgrounds. Dr. Patel speaks of his own childhood growing up in Chicago and learning to negotiate difference and diversity. In 1998, he attended an interfaith conference at Stanford University where he and several other young attendees engaged with one another to build an interfaith youth movement with service as its bridge. While pursuing his doctoral degree following his education at the University of Illinois, he studied at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. And there he organized interfaith youth service projects in South Africa, India, and Sri Lanka. He returned to Chicago in 2001 and went to work launching a similar idea in the United States. In 2002, with the support of a grant from the Ford Foundation, Dr. Patel established the Interfaith Youth Corps. Since then, he has continued to provide innovative leadership to that organization, and he's become a frequent contributor to the Washington Post, USA Today, and the Huffington Post. Harry Calvin, Jr., a law professor at the University of Chicago, once said something that Benjamin Mays believed about Morehouse, Robert Hutchins believed about the University of Chicago. I quote, the university is the institution which creates discontent with existing social arrangements and proposes new ones. Dr. Patel shares that outlook. His other great insight is that college students have a special role to play in leading change. And what members of my generation and older did in the area of race relations and promoting tolerance, tearing down walls of misunderstanding, Dr. Patel believes we must now do, and particularly your generation, must take up the mantle in promoting interreligious understanding and cooperation. Recently, I was with him where he addressed several hundred college presidents in Florida. He was electrifying then, and it's now my great pleasure to welcome him to Morehouse College, this man who serves at President Obama's request on the Advisory Council on Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships and one of U.S. News and World Report's America's Best Leaders of 2009. Morehouse College, please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Ebo Patel. For an American, there are few honors equal to the opportunity to reflect on the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. in the city where he was born and at the institution where so much of his moral, intellectual, and leadership formation took place. I owe my citizenship to King, to everyone whose response to being cut out of the American project 
was to call this nation not a lie, but a broken promise, to use their bodies and their blood to mend it. I want to thank those who issued this invitation. Dean Carter, Roy Kraft, Terry Walker, President Franklin. I've had the chance to see them evoke admiration for a few brief moments on this campus and also elsewhere. Mr. Kraft and Mr. Walker have been presences at the Interfaith Leadership Institutes my organization leads and have inspired the students that they've worked with. And I had the opportunity to see President Franklin at this college president's summit a week back and saw the reverence with which his peers hold him. I address my remarks today to the students here at Morehouse. The man of whom we speak wasn't the president of this institution. He wasn't a professor. He wasn't a member of the tap chapel staff. He was a student, like you, 15 years old when he set foot on this campus. King experimented with his identity at Morehouse. He arrived here thinking he might be a doctor, soon decided the medical sciences weren't for him. He thought for some time about becoming a lawyer. It's striking to think of King questioning his vocation. It's so easy to listen to those great speeches and sermons and imagine King popping out of the womb a preacher, literally born into the pulpit. But King went through a series of serious changes while he was here, as I imagine you are going through a series of serious changes yourself. For King, these changes impacted even his religious identity. He had, as you all know, a strong religious upbringing. His father was a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. His house was down the block from his church. But by his second year here at Morehouse, he talked about not wanting to go to church at all. When he finally embraced the vocation of his lineage, saying that being a Baptist preacher was my being and my heritage, Daddy King rejoiced, telling the congregation at Ebenezer that God had called his son to the pulpit. But even as young Martin preached those first sermons, there was something different. It was clear that his style and his outlook were different than some of those who had gone before. He was having what a Morehouse experience promises, a deepening into his roots and a spreading of his wings. For the first time in my life, I realized that nobody there was afraid, King said of Morehouse. I imagine this has something to do with being part of a community where people share an important physical attribute. But King had grown up in that community, and so I imagine there's something else at play here. I think the content of the intellectual and moral character of this university shaped Martin Luther King's vision. I think King found here an environment where he could dream the world anew and acquire the skills and the knowledge to build that new world. There are moral laws of the universe that no man can violate any more than he can violate the physical laws, King said in his senior class sermon at this university, startling his fellow students with that clarity and passion that the world would soon come to know. If I were to boil down the heart of what Martin Luther King Jr. thought of as the moral law of the universe, I would use three words. Seek right relationship. When King spoke so many years later in that final sermon of looking over the mountaintop and seeing the promised land, I believe he saw a community of people of different backgrounds following the law of being in right relationship. For this, my favorite image that King uses is the world house. This is the great new problem of mankind, King says. We have inherited a large house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who, because we can never again live apart, have to somehow learn to live together in peace. 
most of what we speak of when we speak of Martin Luther King Jr., building right relationship, is across what his great intellectual mentor, W.E.B. Du Bois, called the issue of the color line. Du Bois famously said it would be the problem of the 20th century, and it is persisting, as you all know, into the 21st. But as King's World House quote suggests, it was not only the problem of the color line that King was concerned with. King sought right relationships everywhere, between black and white, between Easterner and Westerner, between Jew and Gentile, between America and the world, between humanity and God. He was just as concerned with the issue of the faith line as he was with any of the other myriad issues on the world scene. And if you read any newspaper today, you will see that it is the issue of the faith line that is causing tension and shedding blood from Baghdad to Bombay to Belfast. Morehouse's president during the King years was Benjamin Mays, a great admirer of Gandhi. King no doubt heard President Mays speak of Gandhi's teachings during his regular Tuesday lectures. Gandhi's influence on King is widely known. King credits the Mahatma with deepening him into his thinking on nonviolence, showing him that it could be used as an effective tool of social reform. When you go to the King National Memorial site here in Atlanta, it is a statue of Gandhi that greets you at the door. King spoke of learning the method of nonviolence from Gandhi, but drawing his inspiration as a Christian from the example of Jesus. What is striking to me is that King was fully aware that, King, that Gandhi's main inspiration came from elsewhere. As a Hindu, Gandhi looked primarily to the Bhagavad Gita, not the Bible. King did not reject Gandhi because of this difference in belief. In fact, King went to India in 1959 to study the interfaith movement that Gandhi had shaped there. Right relationship with Gandhi meant to learn from the Mahatma. In 1963, a rabbi who escaped the trains running from Warsaw to Auschwitz by six weeks presented himself to Martin Luther King Jr. in Chicago. Abraham Joshua Heschel said that the soul of Judaism was at stake in the civil rights movement and that he wanted to do everything he could to advance the cause. Right relationship with Rabbi Heschel meant to march with him in Selma. Later in the 1960s, King began to receive correspondence from a Vietnamese Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. He told King that his people regarded him as a bodhisattva, a Buddha figure who had attained enlightenment and had chosen to stay on earth to teach others compassion. Why does that compassion not include the suffering Vietnamese of America's war in Southeast Asia. Right relationship with the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh meant for King to change his position on that war. Right relationship between people of different backgrounds is characterized by the deepest essence of the human condition. As King said in his sermon, A Time to Break Silence, this Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is that the force of love is the supreme unifying principle of life. That is where King's image of the beloved community comes from. That is the source of his personal resilience and his imagination for our community resilience. It rolls off the tongue a bit easily to say that you are a student or alum of this university, a Morehouse man. But I know those words occupy a special place, hold a special weight in your minds. The honor of being part of this community comes with significant responsibilities. There are too many people out there who believe faith ought to be a barrier of division or a bomb of destruction. We need you to make it a bridge of cooperation. There are too many people out there building prisons of racial or faith-based isolation. 
We need you to be architects of the world house. Across the generations, when history is called, more housemen have answered. And so must you. And so will you. As T.S. Eliot said, we do not inherit traditions. We work to make ourselves worthy of them. In room 306 of the Lorraine Motel, the room where King spent his final night on earth, the room outside of which he was assassinated, there is a plaque with a line from Genesis. Behold, here comes the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dream. You are what has become of that dream. It's not in changed laws. It's an empowered, committed people. Continue that legacy, Morehouse men. For him, for this college, for each other, for all of us. Thank you. Dr. Patel, Morehouse College thanks you for invoking the spirit of King and reminding us that King was a citizen of the world, something that this college and its faculty and trustees seek to promote and nurture in every man of Morehouse, to be well-traveled. But as we travel, to listen, learn to respect, to read the texts of others. Dr. Patel, you reminded us of Dr. King's own voyage, his pilgrimage to India in 1959. But every man of Morehouse should remember Dr. King himself never met Mahatma Gandhi in the flesh. For you will know, as it is often misquoted around the country this weekend, Gandhi was assassinated in 1948, the very year King graduated from Morehouse. 20 years later, King was assassinated, 1968. And so they were connected, although they did not meet. But the other significant Morehouse connection that Dr. Patel re referenced was that Morehouse man Howard Thurman, who also taught here and inspired King, Howard Thurman was the first African American to meet Mahatma Gandhi in the flesh, 1936. And Thurman returned to Morehouse and talked about that journey and his pilgrimage to nonviolence. And young King and others later would hear Gan Thurman speak of this. In 1975, as a student here, I heard Howard Thurman continuing to come back each year to speak about Gandhi's influence as a powerful disciple of nonviolence. So Dr. Patel, thank you. You have set the tone for a tremendous national weekend of celebrating Dr. King. And I ask you to return to the podium to accept this small token of our appreciation. And whenever we provide uh, a guest with a, the implements of Morehouse, you become an honorary Morehouse man. Thank you very much. <laughs> We have two announcements. We're moving to a new and improved scanning system this semester. Because this process will not be ready until next crown form, <laughs> we will forego scanning today. Before you leave, please uh, remain seated. Please pick up in the lobby of the chapel this flyer with the heading Student Essay Contest, Reading, Writing, and Remembering King, a competitive student essay contest sponsored by Morehouse College. 
There are three cash prizes, and the deadline will be February 29th. Now, I believe we have gathered together somewhere in the chapel the members of Alpha Phi Alpha. Won't you please stand? Okay, these are representatives. I invite all of the student body to give them a tremendous ovation of gratitude for the achievement of constructing the King statue on the National Mall, which will speak to the ages. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, I'm going to invite, as is our custom, the Martin Luther King Chapel Assistants to join the members of Alpha as they prepare to place this wreath in front of the statue on the plaza. All of our invited guests who are here in the Crown Nave should go to the second floor above the lobby, elevators on this side of the lobby, for our special luncheon afterwards. I now invite all of our student body to rise, all of our family, faculty, and staff. And now we are ready for the singing of the Morehouse hymn. 